a chunk of Yellowstone the size of Chicago has been pulsing. In the very middle of the Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming lies a colossal 640,000-year-old caldera crater left behind from a past volcanic eruption. This caldera is a gorgeous and inspiring landmark of geysers and pools heated by the magma churning beneath the water's surface. One of the geysers, the Norris Geyser Basin, has over 500 hydrothermal properties. These geysers change and alter over time and never remain the same. However, for the past 20 years, a geyser segment that has grown larger than Chicago has formed. This geyser continuously lessens and expands by unpredictable bursts of growth. The precise reasoning for this frantic movement is unknown. The phenomenon has been compared to the Earth breathing. Daniel Zarizin, a US geologist who is part of the research team for this strange occurrence, has stated, in all likelihood, Norris has been a center of deformation for a very long time. GPS data and satellite radars were utilized by the researchers to investigate the changes which occurred in the Norris Giza Basin throughout the years. It turns out that during the 1990s, magma flowed beneath Norris and the fluids within the magma bubbled into the Giza's interior. These fluids proceeded to become trapped, increasing pressure within the Giza and causing the ground to rise. Once the fluids were able to escape, the Giza proceeded to deflate. Now, 20 years later, these steaming fluids lie only a mile beneath the Giza. The study does not claim that the Yellowstone supervolcano was a direct cause for the Giza's breathing, but scientists are currently researching whether the supervolcano is influencing the Giza's, and if not, what else could be. The steamboat Giza has likewise been suspiciously active since 2018. Looking into the Norris Giza could provide insight into what is occurring in the caldera in general. Yellowstone's underground geology is complicated and difficult for researchers to fully comprehend, even with years of research. The magma entering and escaping the rocky interior of geysers is the most prominent theory as to why the Norris inflates and deflates. Lead scientist of the US Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, Michael Poland, states, we're only just beginning to understand just how dynamic Norris Giza Basin is. The Norris Giza Basin is the oldest thermal area in Yellowstone, traced back to having been actively thermal for 115,000 years. Between 1996 and 2004, an 18 mile long area of the basin rose nearly 5 whole inches, only to return to its original 2.8 inches by 2013. This didn't last long, as in 2014 it erratically increased to just under 6 inches per year, making it the highest ever uplifted basin in the National Park's extensive history. A magnitude 4.9 earthquake in 2014 managed to cease the sudden growth of the Norris Giza Basin. Then it sunk and inflated unpredictably until 2019, but remained at an average of 5 inches higher than it was back in 2000. According to Zurizin, two weak zones intersecting one another. That would be a place where magma might find an easier way to intrude. However, Michael Poland emphasizes that this is a reasonable hypothesis, but it's by no means certain. It could be various fluids, unrelated to magma such as heavy snowfalls of years gone by, which dug into the holes within the rock and expanded them when they melted and then refroze. If the standing theory of magma trapped beneath the geyser is correct, it could result in a hydrothermal explosion should the rock crack. This results in tremendously boiling waters depressurizing aggressively in a huge watery blast. But scientists are unable to predict when this could occur. This means that the Norris Giza Basin could explode at any moment, but it's likely to be a minor one. Small, unseen alterations deep beneath the ground occur continuously, meaning that the hyperthermal geology of Yellowstone is impossible to micromanage. Crucial changes happen that researchers know nothing about and therefore cannot predict events as they happen. Despite the risk, the team has decided not to close the geyser off to tourists, as the possibility of an explosion remains unlikely. Another question researchers are asking is why some geysers are actively acting up while others are entirely silent. Michael Poland questions, why not Echinus, which is right next to Steamboat?
The team are hoping to investigate the fluids underneath the geysers whenever possible. The team stated how fortunate it is that technology and understanding of geology have advanced in the past two decades, as this would have been impossible 20 years ago. An archaeologist said that parts of Stonehenge were there before humans. Stonehenge is one of the largest mysteries in the UK. Found in the Salisbury Plain, the Stone Circular Monument has invited plenty of questions throughout the years, with many tourists popping by to see the strange stone circle. No matter how popular the site has become, this wonder of the world has had many people asking why the stones were moved to a seemingly random hill in Salisbury and who put the stones there. Now, after years of research, some archaeologists believe they may have some more answers. Mike Pitts, an archaeologist who is just one of a few to have had the opportunity to carry out excavations at Stonehenge, is at the forefront of this 2018 research. He has suggested that the largest, most important stones at Stonehenge, known as Sarsons, could have been sat on that Salisbury hillside for millions of years, predating humans in the area. In the 1970s, archaeologists thought that the Sarsons did not naturally form on Salisbury Plain, but rather that the people who built the fascinating monument randomly chose this hillside and lugged the ginormous stones from Marlborough Downs, which sits 20 miles away. For decades, this was a prompt for many questions. Why would you move the stones so far when it would be far easier to build Stonehenge in Marlborough Downs? Though evidence found by researcher Mike Pitts could answer this question. Two of the stones, Stone 16 and Heel Stone, are not carved or altered at all in their shape. A much more fascinating characteristic is that when the stones line up, they match up to the horizon where the sun sets on the winter solstice and rises come the summer solstice. Thousands of years ago, stones that track the sun so nicely could have had quite the role to play. Stone 16 and Heel Stone are presumed to have had a great deal of significance to the nearby residents when the structure was built. Pitts is evidence that the stones have been here all along and were not dragged up the hillside is founded from two holes close to the stones. Close to the base of the Heel Stone, a hole 20 feet in diameter, was found. Pitts's theory is that this was once a hole with the Heel Stone inside it as it is too large to have been dug to support one of the stones forming Stonehenge as we see it today. Pitts believes the stone was excavated and placed higher on the same hillside, hence the odd hole. He stated, If you are going to move something that large, you would dress it before you move it. To get rid of some of the bulk, he continued, explaining that this suggests it has not been moved very far. The other noteworthy hole is one close to Stone 16, Similarly, to the hole by the heel stone, it is thought that the stones could have been moved to be higher and line up along the solstice axis, followed by the rest of Stonehenge. Further research has shown that the stones were formed in the tertiary period, and Pitts explained that research planned for the future using radiocarbon dating will hopefully show features we associate with Middle Neolithic ritual features, proving our theories correct. There are plenty of theories floating around about Stonehenge, from where it came from and what it was for, with some even suggesting that it was a burial site during the late Neolithic period. Evidence for this also uses the two holes mentioned above, as well as bones around the site too. Other theories focus on the way they align not only with the sun, but the moon and stars too, suggesting some sort of celestial significance. Another popular idea surrounds healing properties. With so many ideas and theories around, it can be tricky to differentiate the archaeological from the speculatory. The age of Stonehenge and how it was built may continue to be a mystery, though it does feel as though we are continuously uncovering more and more. Perhaps in the not-too-distant future, we'll find a more concrete answer. Prehistoric ancestors were resistant to smoke. Researchers from the US allegedly found a genetic mutation our ancient predecessors might have possessed, which made their lungs and bodies far more resistant to the harmful effects of smoke which aided their survival as opposed to the downfall of the Neanderthals. The aryl hydrocarbon receptor gene breaks down particular toxic gases and substances. Hydrocarbons released by burning wood, which often inhaled, can cause cancer. 
The gene causes the aryl hydrocarbon receptors to trigger and cleanse the chemicals from the body. Humans might have been less sensitive to the harmful effects of smoke due to an overproduction of enzymes as well, and this could have ensured our ancestors' survival. The ability to be around fires for long periods of time with little to no harm would have been a great evolutionary advantage for our species. Research shows that Neanderthals, who lacked the mutation, had far more respiratory issues and fertility struggles than Homo sapiens. Dr. Perdue, a researcher on the project, spoke about the theory. We prospered because of this mutation. I wouldn't say Neanderthals died out because of it, but it could have been a contributing factor. After comparing our modern human genetics to our ancestors, Neanderthals and Denisovans, it showed that our ancestors and us are the only ones with such advantage-giving genetics. If these claims of such a helpful mutation are proven as accurate, then this would be one of the very first examples of humans evolving to environmental pollution, but it is still not fully confirmed and currently only a hypothesis. An environmental toxicologist from the University of Massachusetts, Emily Monison, commented on the matter. It wouldn't be unexpected that being exposed to a contaminant that makes you sick would be a selective pressure on humans. You're talking about one helpful adaptation against one chemical, but there's a lot of other harmful particulates in smoke. Monison believes caution should be taken when experimenting on the matter of the mutation and testing whether or not we actually do have it, as it might cause more bad than good. Regardless, the researchers involved wholeheartedly believe in their claims. Beneath the Antarctic ice lies the remnants of lost continents. There are plenty of opportunities for new research to help us delve into the past and uncover elements of history that we may have never been familiar with before. A mapping of Antarctica completed in 2018 seemed to suggest that the remains of what was once an ancient continent could be sat deep below the Antarctic ice. The map showed eastern Antarctica as being divided into several cratons. Cratons are a big block out in the Earth's crust. It is the outermost layer to the layers of the Earth that forms the center, core, or the most important aspect of a continent. The lead author of the study, Jörg Ebbing, a geoscientist located at the Kiel University in Germany, explained that these ancient continents that seem to have been discovered can be traced all the way back to a supercontinent known as Gondwana. This could help to fill in some knowledge as to how Antarctica and these other continents linked to one another. Furthermore, this study's findings may be able to reveal several key facts about the tectonics looking at how the plates interact with one another and what these divisions are, as well as looking at the relation and interaction between the land in Antarctica and the ice sheets. Ebbing continued, explaining that the ice, climate and the distant location means that we admittedly have not got a whole host of information about Antarctica with regards to geology and what precisely is going on beneath the surface. For this study, the team used data obtained from the European Space Agency's Gravity Field and Steady State Ocean Circulation Explorer. This data helped to fill in some questions left in the study. Another satellite data source was used to virtually remove the ice of Antarctica to catch a glimpse at the bedrock beneath it. It was this bedrock layer that uncovered the ancient continents that went into forming Gondwana. It is estimated that Gondwana separated 180 million years ago, and the continents that make up the continents in the southern hemisphere in our modern day were once what formed this supercontinent. The remaining aspects of the supercontinent could possibly be hiding beneath the Antarctic cold. Multiple supernovas may have implanted our solar system with the seeds of planets. Stars are incredibly complex celestial bodies, they go through multiple phases during their lifetime, all of which can determine the next one. They certainly look pretty. The stars in the universe have plenty of question marks around them, making them great points of scientific research. Some 2021 research suggests that a series of exploding stars could be what led to the right climate and conditions for our solar system to exist as we know it today. The research study has been aiming to investigate the conditions of a star-forming region so that we can compare these conditions to those found in our early solar system. Where we see some similarities, 
we might then be able to piece together exactly how the radioactive elements that we know are crucial to allowing planets to form appeared around the Sun in the first place. The team began their study by using condensed, solid material from the cloud of dust that surrounded the newly formed star. Perhaps the most important element found here is aluminium-26, an element that has a somewhat short lifetime and given the long time it takes to form a planet, we can conclude that the source of the element was somewhat close by. Following a series of observations, some researchers have concluded that perhaps it is not a singular source providing the aluminium-26, but rather multiple supernovas. A supernova is the end of a star's life cycle. The star explodes, releasing its mass and causing a sudden surge in brightness. Aluminium-26, the crucial element, is found in the center of massive stars. It is one of many elements formed within them. When the star therefore explodes and the object's materials are distributed across the galaxy, this element that is known to allow planets to form is therefore spread throughout space. When researchers began to take a closer look at the timeline, it is not impossible for this to be an explanation. But some scientists are suggesting that it is improbable. The mass of the star combined with the short span of the element would mean this explosion would have had to occur incredibly recently. For now, what we know for certain is that the impact of aluminium-26 upon the galaxy is incredible, with significant changes occurring thanks to it being there. We just are not quite sure exactly how it got there just yet. But what do you make of these recent discoveries? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.